Information and the question of randomness and non-randomness of approaches of fish from various fluctuations of the regime of the sea is not was not indifferent. So it was claimed that economic and political results of the development of heading fishery will be different depending on what view would be accepted, and therefore setting the question of randomness on, or non-randomness of approaches uh, are uh, of dramatically political nature. So experts found themselves between these two, you know, unpredictable fish and climate and unpredictable and quite uh, cruel solar power in the 1930s. Um, and even uh, the uh, event rose to the high political level. Sergei Kirov, one of the leaders of the Communist Party at that time, he came to Murmansk and gave, gave a speech and he told, it took up 14 years to become confident that there is heron near the coast, but we still fail to send the enough number of energetic people to engage the scaling into good neighborly relations. <laughs> and in my article, I discuss and learned that how the statement could be understood in a way of presenting dreams of harmony with nature that uh, Angie Bruner in his well-known book, Nature of Solid Power, discussed. And in my view, the search for the harmony has also some mysterious color as texts of many of such documents echoed not only the discussion common for this period on the struggle with nature, but also reflect a vestige of magical worldviews when fish could and should obey a human will if it is strong enough. And, uh, uh, you know, but uh, anyway, party leaders like Kirov might have felt that neither scientific nor traditional knowledge of fish behavior can find them from development this magical contact with the fish. However, the authorities in general still needed experts as mediators between the political view and unpredictable fish. And uh, approaching to, to traditional knowledge didn't work. Actually, the voices of the local people who knew, you know, they pointed to the existence of large heading fluctuations in this region in the past. But these voices were completely silenced. As, as also the voices of scientists who are being mediators and articulated their voices, that actually fluctuations already been in place. Uh, the Bolshevik power wanted to start everything from the clean page, you know, they didn't want to know anything about the past. So uh, the whim of nature that so timely brought a large amount of heading, uh, uh, you know, was uh, actually uh, the last season was 1935, of successful heading fishing. And then you see it was an enormous drop and the uh, heading suddenly disappeared after this four years of good catches. Expert, you still need to. Uh, Pictures are important for the talk. I can do it. I can Okay. So these are the pictures of local fishermen who were not listened to, were silenced. And uh, this is, um, you know, uh, the graph of, of uh, and catches, and you see this enormous drop that Helen never came back uh, in such an amount, and uh, it, it, you know, Ah, uh, completely, completely. It's not completely disappeared, but it never returned in such an amount. Uh, so the question is why this happened, and it has certainly several causes at all the natural uh, events, and one cause lies in the realm of fish biology, so it was a particular strong year class of heading. Uh, but, um, you know, at that time, uh, scientific knowledge of heading biology was extremely scarce. It was not well understood where it comes from, where it goes, and most importantly, what caused sharp of its numbers. Uh, and uh, uh, only later, reliable knowledge of the migration patterns of the Kalian being, uh, being uh, introduced. 
only imagine uh, 50s. And uh, so, but already at that time, there were suggestions that uh, it fall near the Norwegian coast and just come into the Barents Sea um, for, for feeding. Um, and I'm sorry. Then it disappeared. Okay. But it should be best when I have to Yeah, yes. Yeah, maybe it would be better. Maybe then I can stay here and talk to you. predictable behavior of heading with a rapid warming of the Arctic waters. But the possibility of dependence on heading approaches even from such long-term climate fluctuations didn't suit the authorities who searched for a constant avail availability of fish resources for Soviet power. Thus, the hypothesis of the dependence of heading migrations from climate fluctuation was sharply criticized, especially for, by fisheries managers and, and, and fisheries journals. However, Lev Berg, who was one of the leading biologists and geographers of that time, he somehow overcome these uh, shortages and he published in Geographical Journal, not in the Fisheries Science Journal. And uh, he published a uh, paper in Russian and also one uh, very international in German, which is still quite open cited. Uh, he, uh, you know, continued to gather more and more data of different kind changes of distribution patterns of boreal fish, not only heading in these waters. And in these papers, he moved away from his earlier views on the stability of climate and historical period. It was in as early as in uh, 1914, he wrote a very important book, Climate and Life, where he told that no climate is stable, it's only geographical or geological changes. But by that time, he changed his mind. And this warming of the Arctic and all this event around fisheries been very important for uh, that uh, changes um, in, uh, in his and others' mind. He was very important for the Soviet science in general. But he still concluded that how long this warming, which is breaking the general tendency of climate and the historical time will continue, is not possible to judge now. So they're not just a warming, but they thought that it's just a, just a periodic uh, cyclic event. And uh, such an opinion echoed by uh, scientists in other countries, for instance, uh, Danish fisheries scientists Jensen and Hansen, uh, they published a paper about changes of pattern of Greenlandic cod, uh, which uh, became very important for the changes in Greenlandic fisheries in general. And they also wrote that changes in the waters of Greenland are so far reaching, so great in character that we hardly know anything similar, but one must be prepared, however, for a swing back to the earliest condition uh, 
because you know it's just a very very strange event that nobody noticed before. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in general, you know what you know now about this woman of the Arctic. So um, this is quite old, but uh, I, I thought quite important paper by uh, you know, Norwegian, most Norwegian climatologist from two side, uh, 2004. Then they claimed that this woman is one of the most puzzling climate anomalies of the 20th century. So over a period of some 15 years, the Arctic warmed by 1.7 degrees and remained warm for more than a decade. This is, they claim that this is a warming in the region comparable in magnitude to what is to be expected as a consequence of the anthropogenic climate change. But that certainly is not true now, because what we know now under the term Arctic amplification, that warming of the Arctic is going and going further and further, and now it's about 3.5 or even four times faster from the globe. So it's this is this peak of 20s and, and, and 40s, which is not any more comparable with what is going on now. Why Arctic was warming in 1920s, 1940s? Uh, in uh, um, this important paper, early 20th century Arctic warming, in, in retrospect, Kevin Wood, James Overland from uh, Noir, uh, they uh, wrote that, you know, discussion of potential causes of the early climatic fluctuation has been underway for more than 70 years and still ongoing, and it is a consensus now that the early climatic fluctuation was principally due to intrinsic variability in the large-scale atmosphere, ocean, land system. Um, and uh, in some new publications, for instance, this one from 2018, um, you know, the climatologists put this Arctic woman uh, on, as a part of the early, what is now known early 20th century warming in general. So you see there is a graph of global temperatures and you see it's a little bit of peak, but not that much as in the Arctic. So uh, <clears throat> again, it was part of the, a universal process, but Arctic had its own uh, own uh, variability, and I think it's a consensus now that you know most of that uh, variability being caused just by natural fluctuations, natural events, and climate, not by the, by anthropogenic global warming, which is going on now, and especially the ocean put a, a large had a large impact on that. So if you see here oceanic temperatures, it's much more growth at that time than uh, the land temperatures. So something happened with the ocean. And uh, uh, now I will do a short excourse into biology, and then I come back to this history of uh, management, uh, history of climate understanding of what went in the ocean. So this part, the Barents, the Barents Sea, uh, is a border of two geographical zones, boreal geographical area and Arctic geographical area. So there are yeah. species which are going from west to east, there are boreal species which are moving with the growing of the temperature to the east. And this Arctic animals, they are going vice versa. When it's becoming too warm, you know, they, they are, you know, dispersing in, in a larger territories. Yeah, so there is a major, major, major changes in what's going on. And even such a places like, for instance, White Sea, which is a small bay here, um, is a part of that uh, of that process. And White Sea was a region which I probably studied most of what balance in the White Sea. And for instance, we see these changes of women of the Arctic of that period on the catches of the White Sea Hadian. And uh, even salmon changed their migration rules. And the salmon is very much, you know, uh, attached to the rivers where it's born. You know, it's got home in, so it's coming to the places where it's born. So the changes of the distribution of salmon is really re quite remarkable event. So it could be found in, in a quite uh, distant, distant places. We need a bit more research for what happened with salmon in the 1930s, which has gathered some information. And it's important uh, for me and for the group of people I used to work on, on that issues, you know, that we already studied historical, long-term historical data uh, on salmon before and uh, using uh, important uh, histor historical sources like archives of old monasteries around the White Sea area. And we collected historical data starting from uh, 17th century 
and compare them with uh, the data that they accumulated from statistical data of late 19th century. And actually, uh, you know, uh, published a research on an association between Atlantic salmon population abundance and climate indicators, which very clearly shown that in the warmer periods, more salmon uh, could be uh, could be caught in uh, these uh, places. So for 1930s, it also should be the case, but we need a bit more uh, work on that. Uh, another fish which we studied in this connection of the warming of the Arctic uh, and comparing this historical period of warming, latest porches and what is going on now, is a very small fish white sea stickleback, which is not so important for industry, but it's very important for the ecosystem because it's a fish that other fish eat and birds eat, so it's a very important um, key species for the ecosystem, and you see, and also just recently published it in the same ISIS Journal of Marine Science as the previous paper on salmon, and you see also here, you know, that uh, climate really affected uh, the number of fish in this period, and also, uh, you know, the fish was almost absent uh, in the uh, late 20th century, it became grow, and now it's also at an enormous amount and important for the ecosystem. Yeah, so, but, you know, coming back to, to history, yeah, uh, what uh, I'm most interested uh, in addition to all this more, you know, scientific uh, studies of what happened with uh, ocean and oceanic creatures, I'm interested in how scientists interpret uh, environmental changes in uh, connections between science and government, authority of science, and transfer of, of you know, circulation of knowledge between scientific communities. And these very general questions for history of science are especially interesting to study while looking how scientists interpret the environment which we do not know well, such as the Arctic in 1930s. Um, in one of the research I did that kind of scheme, you know, just putting all together the main group of experts and uh, actually combining, you know, the experts from Scandinavia, whose names are in yellow, and experts from Russia, whose names are in, in white. Um, and, uh, you know, try to understand who and when and how reflected this warming of the Arctic of 1920s, 1940s. So for air temperature, those Scandinavians, especially, you know, they noticed in several places uh, the increase of air temperature, especially Spitsbergen, you know, you see it's a very rapid uh, growth of air temperature. Uh, and here, data for Stockholm also for 1930s. Uh, we also know certainly that uh, for the ocean as early as 1909, you know, Fritjof of Nans and Bjorka and Hans and great Norwegians, they had pointed out a correlation between the temperature of the North Cape current part of Gulf Stream uh, <laughs> and the state of ice in the Bering Sea in the same year. And uh, uh, this all was, you know, taken also on board by Russian Soviet scientists, especially uh, this uh, Mormon scientific fishery expedition that worked on the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea Program and established very important hydrographic section here in Polar Meridian, which has continued since uh, the very beginning of 20th century up to today. So it's the longest uh, hydrographic uh, data that uh, would reflect these changes in, in temperature in the ocean. And uh, so, you know, what, what they found uh, already in 1920s, uh, that uh, the ocean temperature has temperature really grown, and then it's grown more in 1930s, and uh, that uh, changed very much the understanding of, of what's going on. And now it's conceptualized as a regime shift, you know, and um, in different time periods, a complete regime of the ocean changed uh, and became becoming warmer. Then again, it was a colder period in the 70s, 90s, then a new warm period uh, with uh, current uh, global warming uh, began. 
Um, interestingly, uh, that uh, in that period of Nigerian uh, searches, especially during what is known the second international polar year in 1932 33, that was, was the major international cooperation, and the Arctic and Soviet scientists played a great role in that. Um, oceanographers like this Nikolai Zubov, who actually been trained in Norway in Bergen under Bjorn Helen Hansen's supervision before the revolution. So he was very much, you know, aware on all the methodology of uh, oceanographic research. Uh, he predicted that it will be less, much less ice and organized an expedition around the Franz Josef land and the fulfilled it successfully on a very, very small, uh, small wooden uh, vessel named after Nikolai Knipovich, actually the scientist who first mentioned this uh, woman of the oceanic water on the Kola Meridian, and he published that internationally. Another scientist, Vladimir Wiese, already in 1924 published in German about changes of uh, sea ice and atmosphere. Uh, in, in the same region. And the same year, 1932, uh, during the second national polar year, he led the first single season crossing of the Northeast Passage of the Northern Sea Route. It was for the first time in history that it was done in one season. Well, a couple of previous expeditions, they needed to overwinter because they were not able to get through. It's certainly technology because it's much better shape, like uh, not, not fully icebreaker, but ice ship, they called it. And uh, as it was usually emphasized in Soviet literature, it's a heroism, so it was, but it's also environment. Environment always being undermined. So the literature not really not really good. Much, um, much attention in, 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 among politicians, but uh, scientists did put attention. Um, but uh, yeah, and already by the time when uh, the second polar year had been finished, this idea of changing climate became globally acknowledged. This is an American publication from Weather Bureau of Washington, D.C., under the title, Is Our Climate Changing? And uh, there is some kind of amusement they wrote. Uh, he wrote that historic climate has always been considered by climatologists to be a rather stable thing, but something is going on now globally and also in the Arctic. So it's becoming a universal, universal question. Uh, this scientist from Sweden played a major uh, role in a uh, more broad understanding of climate change. And uh, Hans Wilson Alman, he studied uh, glaciers uh, around the North Atlantic Ocean in Greenland, Spitsbergen, uh, Northern Sweden. And uh, he, you know, been in very close contact with Soviet scientists, which republished this paper in Journal of Historical Geography some years ago, specifically on uh, the politics of Scandinavian Soviet networks and the project physical field science, which is based on studies of correspondence, uh, which are found in archives, uh, correspondence of Palman with Soviet scientists. Uh, and, uh, you know, his ideas of the warming of the Arctic, he actually named it improvement of the northern climate. For him, it was not a danger, it was not a threat. He thought that it would be good that, you know, in this northern countries like Sweden, Russia, the climate would be better. He summarized his finding, uh, for instance, in 1948, uh, in one of the special meeting of this International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, where he pointed out uh, the extent of warming in northern waters as a part of the larger scale change and strongly marked by increasing air temperature, receding glaciers, decreasing extent and thickness of the ice and influence of fish distribu distribution. Um, some, uh, you know, in the same years, as actually 1945, before actually the Cold War began, there were quite broad discussions in Royal Geographical Society in London, where women met with Soviet scientists and with uh, British scientists, like Gordon Manley, the leading climatologist of that time. And uh, they discussed this climatic improvement. And from the Soviet side, it was Evgeny Fyodorov, who'd been at the meeting, who later became very prominent Soviet climatologist. For instance, he gave the second plenary at the first international conference on climate in 1979, where he argued uh, for the support of the global climate warming with anthropogenic forces. So he was, uh, really, and you know, all these early interactions uh, certainly very important uh, for, for his development. 
And in general, the circulation of knowledge has even continued during the Cold War, when you know some books by Visa and Zubov about uh, climate uh, of the Soviet uh, Arctic, especially the seas of the Soviet Arctic, being translated, is partly by Arctic Institute of uh, North America, and vice versa. Alman's papers being translated uh, into Russian in the framework of a new international cooperation, International Geophysical Year of 1957 Um, Yeah, important, uh, you know, uh, legacy of all that uh, noticing of women of the Arctic of 1920s, 1940s, which actually came to an end, yeah, by, by 60s, it started a whole quite cold period, is uh, that it looked like a cycle, you know, and there is always a hypnotism about cycles that seems to attract people, like you know, this American astronomer, and as we put it, it draws all kinds of creatures out of the woodwork. When you see the cycle, you start to imagine the cyclic nature of the event. Uh, and uh, by, by 50, 70s, attempts to find cycles uh, were still were widespread, and Soviet Arctic research was still on the same page. There were still some you know, the conferences, uh, why international conferences, they discussed the possibility of the cycles. Since 70s, the obsession with cycles and fluctuations was becoming more and more out of date with the uh, rose of agenda for uh, global climate change with anthropogenic causes, less and less scientists thought about cycles. However, this legacy and this inertia uh, of um, especially research in the Arctic persisted among Soviet and even partly among post-Soviet polar scientists, especially oceanographers and sea ice specialists. When we see, uh, you know, we studied the scientific landscapes and interviewed uh, scientists uh, from Arctic Antarctic Research Institute and St. Petersburg and from, uh, for instance, uh, Geophysical Observatory, we see a huge difference. People in the observatory and other climate institutes, they all, uh, so to say, have been confident and worked with the global climate change uh, with anthropogenic Courses while still some scientists in the Arctic Research Institute they still thought in this paradigm paradigm of cycles. And that had also some kind of history. For instance, it was a scientific conflict uh, of uh, this person, Igor, Ma Igor Maximov, who was very important for polar oceanography, and Mikhail Budika, uh, who was one of the major proponents of anthropogenic climate change, very well known internationally. He worked a lot with American climatologists. And um, the agreement of for environment between US and USSR started from 1972 and continued in the 80s. Uh, he was one of the authors of the well known book Climate for Future that were made uh, collectively by Americans and Soviets, published in 1990. Um, so uh, so these two two paradigms have uh, been, been uh, quite uh, quite in conflict. And what has uh, interested me that we've seen from some interviews we were taken uh, 10 years ago, and it was a continuous project we did it uh, from time to time, and also from the literature that still references to the women of the Arctic of 20s and 40s uh, uh, were, you know, you to legitimize the skeptic skepticism on the anthropogenic cause of current global warming. It's coming more and more, you know, less and less, but still you can find something like that published in 2018, certainly only in Russian, because it's, it's a, it wouldn't be published internationally, but you know, still that, that the characteristics of the first and second woman of the Arctic are about the same, which is certainly not the case. And there are some publications that global women in the Arctic is in Coming back to this uh, graph of Arctic amplification, we see that they're definitely not the same. And also now we definitely know that the causes are are completely different what happened in that time and what is happening now. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I actually tried to summarize here some pieces from many projects and international projects I was part of, you know, so this biological part uh, came from history of marine animal populations, a very long lasting project, which was uh, funded by the Sloan Foundation. From United States, and then it was a large project on 
uh, history of uh, science in the Arctic, uh, exactly during the recent International Polar Year 2007 to 2008. And I was a Marie Curie Research Fellow in the University of Birmingham in the UK and participated in a project with Swedish colleagues. Uh, and several projects. And most recently, it was uh, just finished. We are writing a book now, you know, project on Soviet climate science and its intellectual legacies. It's uh, British funded. Thanks so much. Thank you, Yulia, uh, for this very rich um, overview of a very complex uh, issue. Um, I would like to just open the floor for questions. I will reserve my question later. Let's run. At the end, one of your last slides had the quote from Izvestia, mm -hmm. Global Neopatipalia uh, at the MIF. Mm -hmm. So who is writing this? Are these journalists, politicians? Um, who are deciding climate policy, and we have climate deniers here, we don't have to go all the way mm -hmm. to Russia, mm -hmm. or are they citing scientific evidence? Um, actually, this was based on uh, on the interview with a scientist from the Arctic Institute, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, he, he, and he died in 2014, but we were interviewed him in June 2013, and he still was very much confident that it's all the solar variation. He was, you know, very much attached to the idea of cycles and that solar variation causes all the climate changes, not the anthropogenic. And because of that, these people from the Arctic Institute, uh, they always uh, told, oh, next year will be cold. I remember I come and I need to do it. I calculated everything. It will be much colder next year. <laughs> <laughs> then I <laughs> visited him the over the year and he gave up. It was a mistake. But next year, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. I, I mean, related to that, so um, I mean, you can find in any country um, a voice that says that. Um, the point is that there are thousands of voices in the other direction. So. And I'm sure that's right in Russia too. That the scientific evidence is so clear and so overwhelming that you basically, particularly in the Arctic, as you said, is kind of even more drastic. So you cannot you cannot hold that argument if you're um, argue, if, if you if you just focus on logic and rationale. This is not um, you cannot keep that argument alive. Nevertheless, every country has one or two because it pays, right? So you can always find, I mean, PhD supervisor in Switzerland, for example, turned into the one living climate skeptic in Switzerland, and he's paid by the right wing. It just makes sense. So you keep this alive. I don't think this is a real scientific discussion anymore. So what I, my question is, isn't really in Russia what's happening that they know, of course, they know what's going on, including to the decision making level. And they are basically designing policies like the agricultural development in Siberia that basically relies on the fact that this is man made global warming and that we know it continues to warm. Otherwise, you couldn't use Siberia as agricultural zone. And they are clearly doing that. So they clearly have plans. Where they are looking, at least looking into that. I mean, you know more about that, but I don't. So, isn't that more the general kind of feeling? Or the, isn't that what's happening in, in, in Russia? They know pretty well and they are actually trying to make use of it in a positive way. Yes, you are completely right in, in, in that, that, you know, uh, all who are dealing with climate per se, the climatologists, not with sea ice and other, you know, issues, they are now all convinced with the global warming. Uh, my, but I think that uh, this argument is still important because when you're looking for the legacy in the Arctic science itself, which I am most interested. In. This legacy is very well, well pronounced, you know, less now than 10 years ago. But so historically, for me at least, it's very interesting to, to look how, how it changed. 
And actually, the whole overall policy of the Arctic and Antarctic Institute being somehow connected for the longer time with that, because if they, it was one of the reasons, for, for instance, if they would overall assume that it will be continue to be warmer, they do not need that much of studies of you know sea ice and ice breakers and everything. So, so it's going going both, you know. Uh, yeah, so, but in general, yes, you, you know that, you know, uh, Russia signed the Fed for Paris Agreement, for instance, there's much less discussions, there were huge discussions with Kyoto, Kyoto, you know, protocol, uh, with Kyoto Protocol, you know, yeah. there were huge discussions, and at that time, for instance, I, I think Commission Kondratiev was still alive, which had before that, who was very much pro-cycle and against the global warming. So beginning of the 21st century was certainly very different from what yeah. we see now. But as a historian, I'm interested in this longer, longer line of, of changes. Yeah. Yeah, and as paleoclimatologist, I'm interested in even longer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in the time, right. I think what scientifically what's happening is just you see these cycles they are natural, and most of what you have shown in terms of cycles is the yeah. North Atlantic oscillation mm -hmm. yes. that goes up and down. Absolutely. Except now, the greenhouse mm -hmm. gas forcing is such a sledgehammer and takes everything mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. So, for the early the 20th century, for a lot of time, you still saw these mm -hmm. cycles. Mm -hmm. It was still warm, but now you basically see nothing because the, 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 the greenhouse gas cycle um, is forcing mm -hmm. so strong that everything is dominated by that. Absolutely. So scientifically, this is very not complex. I think that you kind of, we kind of, besides the fact that the Arctic amplification is higher than we understand, mm -hmm. but it's even worse. Mm -hmm. so really but in principle, that kind of change from the cycle to the just straight warming that we have very well understood. Yeah, but in the Soviet Union, it happened later. So as, as for instance, in the theory of continental drift, Soviet Union was 10 years later, you know, because, uh, you know, scientists were stubbornly rejected uh, the evidence. And it was the same with Antipatine culture. So there have always been several groups, but in general, it moved more slow. What I find particularly fascinating in this conversation is that uh, the role of politics uh, and particularly of political power to sway conversations in a, along the lines that are um, related to the ideological and political agenda of the regime. So you have uh, during the Soviet period, uh, the myth about human conquering nature, that kind of optimism, which drives uh, a particular line, regardless of what the scientists are showing as data. Um, and right now, it seems to me that um, this, the improvement of the climate from a very narrow political point of view is also a potential pernicious uh, force in the way in which the scientific information is being processed and utilized, or I'm totally offline here. Um, thank you. Um, there are certainly some lobbies so that it might be good for Russia, for Russian agriculture in Siberia improvement, but what also, you know, the climatologists published that, uh, uh, you know, for instance, a problem of drought might arose. So maybe it would be, it would, might, and certainly it could be better in, in some northern parts of Russia, but it's certainly uh, worsening in the south, most productive parts. But, but would, it, would political utility of certain processes be um, kind of a, creating a blind spot for, uh, the society and for a particular country like Russia to take action uh, timely? Um, yes, definitely, I think. I think especially now I see that it's all, all this climate uh, is very much not generalized from speeches of some politicians, you know, 
uh, we see that they put climate agenda together with LGBT agenda. So you know some. No, it's not not everybody certainly, but there are some some politicians. But it's all Western things. Human rights, LGBT, and climate in one <laughs> sentence. I've seen that. I don't know how how you know central is that now, but I see that it's in politicians. Talk. Yes. Yeah. A uh, lovely talk. Thank you for that. Uh, in the latter part of it, you focused on cycles, um, but throughout your talk, you were also talking about boundaries, whether it was national boundaries or in the case of the research, you were looking primarily at the aquatic component mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. atmosphere. And I wondered whether the Arctic Institute that you mentioned or in your research, you saw any kind of uh, crossing of boundaries between those studying land mammals, so the small Arctic mammal population, mm -hmm. and their cycles compared to what was going on in the ocean with the with the fish cycles. I was wondering whether mm -hmm. there was cross boundary mm -hmm. uh, exchange yeah. there. Oh, that's a good question. No, basically, I do not do didn't see that because I think oceanography. And the fishery has been quite isolated from other ecology in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And the Arctic Institute never worked even with biology. So it worked with biology and surges, but then it completely thrown biology to the, to other institutes. And they only did physical oceanography and sea ice and all that kind of research. So that's a good I will think about that. No, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Great. Thank you. Cultural historian. So well, my question will you bring bring you back in history in the thirties we started with? You said uh, for these thirties that uh, this uh, um, like to be a kind of present for the Soviet power. Uh, putting that in historical and ideological context, this strange natural event, the warming up of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, could be maybe part of uh, another frame of, uh, let's say, um, different utopian and ideological projects of the 20s and the 30s. And that this was the time when the Soviet power had a lot of, let's say, uh, crazy helpers, uh, absolutely uh, sure that the, they can uh, perform social engineering on nature. Starting with uh, Trofim Lysenko, for example, mm -hmm. but not only. Mm -hmm. uh, they had the uh, Institute for Geontology, mm -hmm. they uh, imagined uh, creating uh, Brotherhood of Proletariat by blood transfusion. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, imagined uh, changing the direction of the rivers, they imagined watering the deserts, and so on and so on. And uh, with this uh, natural, uh, let's say, uh, cosmical events, used by this uh, uh, crazy atmosphere of utopias for social engineering of the nature at that time. And um, what was the reaction of the, let's say, uh, Soviet propaganda uh, concerning that event? Hey, I thank you for this question. Yes, obviously it was all this atmosphere of, of social engineering and utopia. And so all this, that I cited the speech by, by Sergei Kirov and he thought that it's a real, of you know people that brought Hedian into you know, neighborhood relations. And there were other articles I studied to consequence the, the press around this event. The articles that you know claim that it was the Arctic by ourselves. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, that it were, you know, this uh, arguments that you know nothing been known about this Hedian. Nobody lived on this shore. This is absolutely nonsense, you know. As a, but you know that Bolsheviks came, and you know by their will the fish also uh, <laughs> So it was a lot of that. Magic. I discussed it in my paper, and I can send you the paper yeah. at Helen, which is more about all the kind of political, uh, political uh, issues. Um, yeah. So yes. So so the inclusion of nature into this overall social engineering view. You you provided all these wonderful examples, which I well studied here. Yeah. Just one of that, yeah. And to find the source of food was so important and surges because you know it's a hungry, it's a famine. Yes, yeah. And agriculture failed. You know, no, no this protein. Cool 
no protein in the country because cattle breeding is completely, you know, is a complete disaster. And herring is a very convenient fish. Even in the <laughs> Russia now for food, you know, we have these cards for, you know, the people who Russia does their food. Herring was a separate issue. Because herring, when it is salted, it was sustained for months, it's easy to transport inland. So it's a very, very important food item. I have a very related question to that. I was thinking about the end goal of you know the scientists and the human trying try to figure out what's happening with the Arctic and the warming. So because on the one hand that is about fish and you know it's a resource and it's a very practical use. On the other hand, it is about the conquest of nature, but then it becomes theoretical. And I'm just curious about because you know understanding this you know requires funding and, and, and etc. So I'm wondering about what's what's the end goal, what were they trying to figure out? What was the bigger mm -hmm. question? And maybe does it change throughout time and if it does with why and what mm -hmm. it's way? Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, it certainly changed. So it's a very beginning, and I tried to, to, to present it was some kind of opposition to them uh, that climate could rule, for instance, the fish catch. Because if you accept this climatic process, which are unpredictable, then all the social engineering becoming much more difficult. You can't predict. So you can't put it into a five-year plan. It were a lot of that. And, and even you know, scientists, some scientists being uh, uh, accused of a bad prediction and the biological station was closed, uh, scientists being even arrested, you know, it was in, in my paper. Yeah. So so that the demand to predict was very important because of the planning, yeah, the nuclear plan. Um, but, uh, you know, on the other hand, it's certainly been uh, the swarming being used, for instance, for this transportation research along the Siberian coast. So it was this double, double politics, so to say. Then they really understood that there is a climate. You can't deny its influence anymore. So later, more uh, money being put into, into studies, and especially the studies of sea ice in the 30s and late 30s. That was one of the great actually success in a way, because it was a lot of funding for, for sea ice. And when, for instance, American figured out uh, after the war that there is so much data on sort of things, they, for instance, in 50, Eight, they organized an international conference on sea ice in Maryland and invited sort of scientists that are trying to, to have some exchanges already, uh, you know, after the Soviet Union became a bit more open after, after 55, so it was 58. So the sea ice, you know, studies which is related certainly to climate, but they also had clear military implications, especially with the beginning of the Cold War, when Arctic became the closest closest route, you know, for airplanes, for submarines. So a lot of money came to see us. You somewhat preempted uh, my question, but I had a question related to history to the 1930s, to also the broader period. What was the cost of failure? Because like we, sp you saw that, for instance, you know, the herring statistics, they crashed, and, you know, they, you know, they rose, then they crashed. And as you mentioned, the five-year plans didn't always succeed. Um, so I'm just curious, because there was this extreme emphasis on success, extreme emphasis on achieving your goal, and if you don't achieve a goal, you're a traitor or you know, worse. Um, so the question becomes, what was the cost of failure for scientists? And then whether there was a way to sort of mitigate the ire or the anger of the central government? Well, as I told, you know, several scientists, uh, that's a cool institute, the biological station being closed, another institution being transported into, you know, changed and, uh, you know, transported to another place. So it was a low cost for, for scientists, yes. Sometimes it's a real cause, sometimes they use this as a pretext, sort of say, to move scientists from this coast anyway, because the coast started to be developed as a military, you know, as well. It's still our days in the basis basis in this place where you know, no biological stations is for instance. Yeah. So so that's that's cool. Yeah. yeah. 
And, and uh, generally for economy, I do not think it was a major because financial loss because it's still not that large now. So expectations were much more than actual cash. And uh, yeah, and they also from um, 35, they changed the technology. They started to send fishing uh, vessels uh, into the ocean itself. So because so, this fisheries wasn't very much in shore. And then they understood that its heading will not come and show anymore. They started to go further to, and further to Bergen after the war started to go to Iceland. So, you know, it, it changed the, the pattern of fishing. I have a tangential question also. You mentioned, I think, in the, that they were counting the amount of fish that they caught, including they had data from the 17th century. Right. Yeah, that's what we revealed in the project. I was, I was curious, how do you know that? Just how do you count how much fish you caught in the 17th century? Uh, um, <laughs> we were quite, quite happy with colleagues, with especially my colleagues. Well, I can't read documents from the 17th century. It's Alexei Tchaikovsky and his team, you know, who did that. Uh, and uh, they turned to be that in, mana in monasteries, they kept very well the financial documents and for uh, taxes. And for overall trade, you know, they needed to know how much fish they get. Uh, and it's not that easy because you also need to calculate the rate share because monasteries shared with fish with peasants. And so uh, you need, oh yeah, so you need to know the contents to actually calculate uh, the actual, the overall page from the data you put from the monastery. But it's a so it's a snapshot, so it's not every year, unfortunately, because a lot of archives been lost and they just were not preserved. I read somewhere that, you know, when after the revolution, historians sorted out what to keep, what to throw away. They thought that it's most important to keep different documents. But nobody thought that the similar documents for the range of years would be useful because, and, and, and because of that, you know, historians certainly knew about these books. And they use them for their purpose, but uh, also before biologists start to ask these scientific questions, nobody actually looked at the documents from that point of view. So that's the way it's I'm just um, one a little bit more of a presentist question, but um, I mean, one thing that really struck me about your presentation is the fact that international cooperation is a huge part of Arctic science all throughout the 20th century. Given the current geopolitical situation, is that sort of cooperation that has been the norm for Arctic science? Is is that still possible? What are the prospects for international cooperation on a lot of these climate questions um, going forward? Uh, thank you. It's a very good question. Yes, actually, I was surprised with even for the, for instance, year 1938, I opened a folder of Vladimir Visa, one of the scientists I mentioned, and it was full of a telegram for, for his jubilee, even from the United States. We all think that uh, uh, 38 is country was completely closed. It was not. So the worst period was the very first five years of the Cold War, 47, 33, then but still some, some correspondence you can find, but you know, yeah, uh, so so the, the, the federation went on all the time because with fish, you can't do it uh, nationally with the ocean in general. Yeah, so the slogan of the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea founded in 1902 was actually fish and parents do not know boundaries. Yeah, you, you can't. And so, so the very first, you know, in the 50s, when it became again possible to calculate, the first thing that scientists in Murmansk and the Bible Sea did, they sent a ship with scientists to Bergen, to Norway, exactly to discuss Helen. Because Helen is spawning in Norway at the time, they already knew that, and it's coming here. So you can't, you can't work with that. And up to, I don't know how it's this year, and it's, probably it doesn't work anymore, but before this war, uh, you know, the bilateral uh, Russian-Norwegian Fisheries Commission, very important management instrument for uh, managing of fish stocks in the Bayern Sea, because you can't do it alone. Yeah, I don't know how it will, will proceed. Yeah, yeah. Could I add how we know each other? Yeah. So we know each other because of an international organization that was set up um, 
uh, in parallel with ICES that she mentioned in her talk, but this one is called Pisces. In the <laughs> but it's for the cooperation in the North Pacific, and it um, the scientists continue to this day to cooperate despite the political overlay. It's an international treaty. They have to be cognizant of that, but they still communicate. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Well, just you, you've been in uh, Oregon uh, two months before coming here, and in the local fisheries museum, we found that it's this some ex exhibition about fisheries cooperation in the Pacific between America and Soviet Union in seventies, nineteen seventy-eight, and they still sell T-shirts with you know both flags and from the fishing, <laughs> and they they are now discounted up to two dollars. <laughs> about knowledge production in, in what Russia and Soviet Union, kind of the way our discussion has been going, it's always kind of been, it's all included at like snickering at kind of the practices that scientists kind of stayed in the 30s in the Soviet Union, also in Russia today, maybe in China, they're kind of selecting what certain things they want to believe and don't believe, certain information they want to include and not include um, in their understanding of environment, climate change, Herring, uh, herring patches. And so I think rightfully so, we're very kind of skeptical of their, their, how they are collecting knowledge and, and um, doing research. Mm -hmm. But then I was really struck by how we were talking about the 17th century and uh, it's this question about uh, how they were studying. I think we, in some ways that the response, their reaction was or like the the conclusion was that actually these 17th century monasteries were really accurate and really, um, you know, had very strong practices. I mean, I guess I'm just wondering, like, is is it the 20th century and beyond that's the problem? And kind of that's that's where knowledge production in Russia and the Soviet Union kind of came a nadir and has kind of stayed the same way. I mean, what is the takeaway? Or we just do we, must we be somewhat skeptical of? Was the golden age against the knowledge production and science and knowledge production maybe in the 17th century? <laughs> no, it definitely was not. You know, <laughs> monasteries kept this for completely for financial issues. They were not interested in knowledge production at all. Mm -hmm. um, the holes, no. Um, 19th century also had quite good institutions for knowledge production. So it's a long tradition of knowledge production. Is, there, is it a pre Soviet story then? Is kind of, is what? the Soviet Union beyond kind of like the end of like kind of legitimate research practices, studies? Yeah, the Russian Academy of Science has been, been founded in 1725, and since then it's a continuous knowledge production. So no interruption of knowledge production, even in the most difficult times. Yeah, so. So I, know, I know knowledge was produced during all of the, all of the difficult times. So my question is, you know, when you've been kind of skeptical of certain practices during that period, is that skeptical? Is that as skeptical as you need to that period to the twentieth? So what period? Twentieth century. I don't know why you are so skeptical. You could be skeptical for oh, no, statistics. Skeptical. I was just kind of you know, laughing at the revolutionary like, practices of the political transformation of keeping certain things from different eras, and and also we began the discussion with the how the, the the Russian scientists are kind of selectively using this warming theory to justify their rejection of anthropocene explanations for climate change. It's a bit, I think it's much more complicated story. Yeah, for instance, you mentioned Lysenka, which is certainly a very bad page of Soviet science, but it's also a complicated story in itself, you know. So it didn't stop completely the knowledge production in, in biology. It's it's hindered it for a while, certainly like you know, the kind of Political intervention in, into science, but in general, you know, the accumulation of knowledge always continues. What what is it? It could it could be skeptical, and you are right. Is there statistical data, for instance, statistics for fish cages? Because statistical data not always been accurate uh, in Soviet time. But yeah, that's that's a um, but but we have what we have, so to say. We not always can. To say approximate it, uh, but we need to know that, uh, especially when you take economical and statistical data, that uh, relation. So, uh, to the same question about knowledge production in more simple 
terms uh, in personal categories of the day. In Soviet linguistics, there were people like Nikolai Ma. In Soviet uh, botany, there were people like uh, Trofim Lysenko. In Soviet gerontology, there were people like uh, uh, Alexander uh, Bogdan. What about the uh, uh, climatologists? Uh, they were only scientists, uh, not a single ideological figure among them? Yeah, I do not know a strong ideological figure actually. Uh, so there were controversies among scientists, partly I, I talked about that. Um, Good question. No, not, not on that scale. Probably it was not considered to be that important. We think a bit, uh, you know, been important here, for instance, with the Stalin plan for transformation of nature. Actually, Mikhail Budika started his career under the Stalin's plans for transformation of nature, but he, he actually managed in addition to some crazy ideas. He's known also for crazy ideas. Just to put a black powder on the ice to, to melt it more fast. There were a lot of crazy ideas in, in, in 50s of, of, of women as an as a improvement. And Budika, and Budika also, also did something like that, but he was not that powerful, he was young. But he also managed to do some good research under this overall umbrella of Stalin plan for transformation of nature. For instance, he began his studies of the earth uh, balance, uh, Balance under heat balance under that plan. So scientists always, you know, in the Soviet Union, uh, if they wanted to do science, they were able to find possibilities. So yeah, it's it's a it's a long complicated story. A lot is written on the different on listen case I think it's evident that the Soviet Union there's so much that Julia can offer to our communities, and we should tap into that another time as well. But I want to thank all of you uh, for being such a wonderful audience. And thank you, Julia, for this very fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.